Happy politics and happy Friday, and welcome to a special Friday edition of your favorite podcast and, well, my favorite podcast, BC Poly Hot Stove. In fact, that's not even true. It's obviously unspun. My name is McLean Hold Kay. Up. I'm the editor-in-chief of oh. the org. <laughs> McLean, I will have you oh. know, this is the 102nd oh. edition of the BC Poly Hot Stove. So I'm just saying... We're three is it ahead. actually? Yeah, we're three ahead of Unspun. I went and counted this morning because, you know me, uh, competitively, I got to stay ahead of uh, Jody, if not in quality, certainly not in quality, but definitely in quantity. So there you go. 102. By three. Yeah, there you go. By three. By, okay. by three percent. And, and if she does five next week, we'll do seven. <laughs> there you go. How? Oh, I now I'm upset. We missed we missed the celebratory hundredth episode. Uh, we yeah. should have done something. I had no idea. Oh, there you go. I'm sure I was complaining about something to do with the uh, BC Liberal Caucus or something. So, you know, it was a, a typical 100th anniversary edition, I guess. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm Jordan, by the way, VP Communications for the Independent <laughs> Contractors and Business Association. We're going to talk BC cabinet picks today as McLean yes, uh, tries to uh, sort through the uh, many texts. Um, but just before we do... Um, Oh, I, oh, shoot, I should have pulled his name before I came on. I got a super nice email. I'm going to talk about more on the next regular edition of the Hot Stove. I got a super nice email yep. from someone uh, laying out why 2020 has been a great year for them. And uh, it's a good reminder on American Thanksgiving weekend to uh, always be grateful no matter what oh. circumstance you're in. Yeah, actually, you know, um, you you mentioned um, I it was I don't know if it was last week, or the week before, uh, where you said, uh, you know, if you've had a good 2020, please reach out to me. Yeah. And um, I I haven't told I haven't you're watching this happen in real time. I haven't told Jordan this. I've received um, I think three emails. One literally minutes before we hit uh, started to hit record on this from people mm-hmm. saying actually my year has been mm-hmm. been pretty good and so i'll uh, i'll read some of those uh, next week i have not read the one that just yeah. came in this morning so i hope it's not you know yeah. something maybe, really uh, awful maybe post it maybe <laughs> post it to the site like a little uh, like a little blurb like uh, hey not everyone's having a crappy year out there here's Absolutely. a couple good news stories that might be kind of nice and I speaking of people who have, because I have dropped my cord and well, now I'm on back speaking, online. Uh, speaking of people who are uh, getting good news uh, in 2020, Selena Robinson, come on yes. down. You're the big winner on the cabinet of John Horgan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is the biggest single promotion. Um, oh, it's yeah. the I mean, aside from being premier, it's the, the biggest position in any this or any government. Mm-hmm. Um, it was obviously filled by Carol James. It'll now be filled by Selena Robinson. It's um, this. She's in an interesting spot in that um, obviously there's no question of running a balanced budget. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the limited. There's no pressure there, but at the same time, I mean, it's not an it, it, it's not limitless. The reserves they have to draw on, and um, I read in uh, was it Vaughn Palmer's piece this morning that there is some whispers that they may not actually release a budget in February. Ooh, um, come on, man. Well, it might be late. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, well, I mean, this is speculation and yeah, months yeah. away. So That's to be fair, but uh, you know, congrats. Yeah. Congratulations to her. Uh, she's inherited a very, very big job. Uh, clearly, John Horgan thinks highly of her. Um, and I wrote about this last night. Um, this after this comes after, you know, not exactly setting the world on fire in municipal affairs and housing. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of what happened in the housing file where, you know, they're, the NDP government's housing targets are just not close to being met. Um, and uh, so we'll see. Congratulations to her. Yeah, she'll be a distinct departure from... Carol James. Uh, Carol, um, widely regarded as very level-headed, um, you know, certainly had good relationships across the aisle with both uh, Greens and, and some BC Liberal MLAs. Very respected, uh, you know, first of all for helping rebuild the uh, BC NDP party and then, you know, taking a back seat to two successive leaders, um, supporting them in, in their work. Um, you know, she, she didn't just bow out of public life, which, uh, you know, she continued on. But, uh, you know, Selena Robinson, different kind of personality, I would say, a uh, little bit more combative, a little bit, um, Carol, Carol James was very partisan, make no mistake about it, she was deeply partisan. But Selena is more publicly partisan, if that makes sense. Like, yes, like no, she, it does, and I think you're right. Yeah, like, I'm not here to say that, oh, you know, Carol was some kind of, is some kind of saint who never, you know, who rose about politics, she didn't. It was always very political with her as well. But there's something about Selena on, uh, you know, uh, social media. She's a lot, uh, she's a lot feistier. So that will be interesting to see. McLean, uh, did any male MLA have a fighting chance at that 
portfolio or because Horgan is male, do you think it was, I like, mean, I, I don't want to talk like, not to say Celine's not qualified. She's as qualified as anyone else in that caucus, frankly. Um, yeah. None of them have really run significant businesses or anything. So it's kind of a wash of people to choose from. But like, do you think that was just always going to be tab because Horgan himself is male? Like, I think that was probably in all things being equal, then that was probably yeah. would have been the preference. Uh, if you're going to have a gender balanced cabinet and make a point of having a gender balanced cabinet, then the, the second ranked, uh, the number one, if you're John Horgan and a Trekkie, um, they think they would prefer a woman. Um, that said, um, I, I don't know that they were hell bound on it. I, I, if someone like, and this is pure speculation, if someone like David Eby had said, you know, damn it, I want the finance portfolio, I mean, they would have considered it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah. So I I don't think it was inevitable, but um, I, I suspect Horgan would have been leaning in that direction. And we know that Horgan, um, he thinks highly of Robinson. He said so on any number of occasions. And so um, yeah. it, it's not a shocking choice. No. And a third of the cabinet stayed put. I mean, Dick stayed in health. E.B. stayed at AG. Yep. Farney stayed at uh, Solgen. Harry Bain stayed in labor, yep. which I have concerns. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Minister George Heyman, Lana Popham staying in agriculture. For Lana, agriculture is like the dream gig. I mean, she... Yeah. And even though she is quite unpopular with many farmers, uh, especially ones on Facebook, um, that is her. That is a file that she adores. So it, it doesn't surprise me that she's held on to that oh they will they will need a crowbar to take her out of that ministry i yeah. think and ralston stays in energy although they renamed it um ralston's yeah. an interesting one because it'll be sites he'll have to navigate the site c decision although let's face it it's gonna be a horgan decision but ralston's the one who'll have to sell it either way yeah it'll be horgan it'll be ralston they they ship out there to answer difficult and tough questions on bad days on the file as the minister. And it'll be Horgan to take credit for when things go well, because that is the way of government. Yes. And Ralston, look, to his career, Ralston does his homework. He's very up to speed on every file he's ever had. He'll be, he'll be devouring, if he hasn't already, he'll, he's been devouring everything on Site C. You can bet there won't be any minister of energy. Like, he, he's done his homework on this. So it'll be interesting to see what he sees and what he thinks are the talking points. Um, Whenever Horgan gets around to actually, you know, admitting that he knew more about Site C than he led on, and <laughs> telling us uh, yeah. what what the plan is going forward. Meanwhile, yeah, I mean, five thousand workers at Site C right now, uh, plugging away exactly. at building that dam. Yeah, I mean, as I wrote this morning or last night, rather, um, I, I think Ralston is probably the most. Uh, unflappable hand they have in yes. co uh, in cabinet, and that includes the premier. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, assigning him to what is probably the biggest single landmine ahead of them right now was probably a good move. Yeah, that's a good point. Unflappable is a good way of describing um, describing Ralston, and it does make me think back now to Robinson and Horgan. Like that could be, there could be some heat there at, at some point. Like they're both very strongly opinionated. You know, will. Mm -hmm. But one is very clearly the boss, so maybe maybe I'm wrong. It'll just be something to keep yeah. an eye on. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, some tension between premiers and finance ministers is not unknown in provincial and federal governments see, elsewhere. See Clark um, so that would not be surprising. <laughs> if you think Jordan is making uh, is laying groundwork no. for accusations, no, this is a no. it is not an unusual thing. No, Kevin Falcon once says finance minister sent out a letter begging his colleagues to quit spending money and saying yes to things, but really. <laughs> no one had said yes to anything except Premier Clark. And so it was essentially a veiled letter to the Premier, like, hey, everyone, I'm trying to balance a budget here. Quit spending dough. Um, yeah. Which uh, she took a, about as well as you would expect. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> that's true. And again, uh, there are other examples as well. Well, Paul Martin, um, Paul Martin and... Uh, I mean, Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin is a great example of two people who yeah. had both had leadership ambitions. Chrétien won, Martin didn't, mm -hmm. and they fought throughout most of the 90s, whether it was a simmering Cold War or all-out war. But frankly, it's a couple of the best budgets in Canadian history came from yeah. that duo. Some of the most fiscally conservative really set the stage for uh, for Canadian prosperity into the 2000s. So um, it can work. You just, you know, as long as the two sides are both willing yeah. to be blunt and honest with each other, and the finance minister always remembers you know, he can't fire the, uh, you know, Selena can't fire John. John can fire her. So as long yes. as that's kind of kept in mind, it's all, it'll all work out. Yeah, I, you mentioned Kretsch and Martin. If, I mean, those two flat out did not like each yeah. other. <laughs> and nope. so if, if that can work, I'm, I'm sure John Horgan and Selena Robinson could make yeah. it work. Who, who um, do like each other, we should say. I, I'm not saying there's yeah. any conflict there. I'm just saying they're both oh, yeah, yeah. pretty opinionated people. So, you know, it could be interesting. 
Um, biggest surprise. I, I, I think this is there's only really one possible choice here for the biggest single surprise. Um, the new minister of education is a rookie yeah. MLA from New Westminster called Jennifer Whiteside. Um, th- when I received the news release yesterday, um, I, I keep track of provincial politics fairly closely, <laughs> as you might know. Um, when I saw the news release, uh, I will admit my first response was, who? <laughs> uh, I had heard the name because you hear, you know, she was elected. And so yeah. the name, but I had to Google to remember where, which riding she was in. Um, yes. There's no comment on her. I just mean that she did not have a particularly high public profile provincially during the election campaign. And to be, first of all, to be made a minister is noteworthy. To be made a minister of education is especially noteworthy. And to be made a minister of education when the BCTF is actively pushing back on a number of things uh, with response with regards to the pandemic response is is frankly wow. Yeah. Um, again, no comment on, on Jennifer Whiteside and herself, who I I frankly don't know that much about. But um, I don't think there is another contender for biggest surprise. No, I, I think you're right. Uh, Whiteside replaced Judy Darcy. So uh, Jennifer Whiteside, former business manager for the hospital as, as MLA, and, not as minister. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, former business manager for the hospital employees union took Judy Darcy's nomination when Judy stepped down. Judy, I believe, was BC Nurses Union, I think, back in the day. Yeah, she was. Anyways, Judy Darcy must be reading the uh, paper this morning, going, "Wait a minute, hold, hold up, hold up. I got you know minister for addictions, thankless job with next to no money in my budget, um, and this rookie comes in and gets education. Like, what? Like, that's uh, a little." I found that an interesting uh, succession plan, but you know, I'm sure Judy's much too nice to ever think like like that. But yeah, it, it was a surprise. Uh, Fleming, Rob Fleming, the former education minister, moves to transportation infrastructure. I know in your mm-hmm. piece, uh, I think it was your piece, you say it's sort of a it sideways move. Um, I disagree. It's a demotion. Um, it it would be a promotion in a BC Liberal Socred cabinet. It's a demotion in an NDP cabinet where education is such a core issue to so many of its uh, key members. Uh, but, you know, not I a, mean, it's a, it's a not reasonable argument you're state. making. Yeah, yeah it, it's not as though he was moved to advanced education. <laughs> but yes, I get Sorry, what you're saying. Sorry, Ann <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, that is uh, definitely, definitely fair. Um, Josie Osborne, uh, Tofino yeah. Mayor, who I believe, I'm sure she's resigned now or is in the process of resigning as Tofino Mayor. She gets municipal affairs, but no housing. Um, that goes with David Eby to AG. So, yeah, as I, um, it's a much smaller file now, uh, municipal affairs, not, not a nothing mm-hmm. file, but, um, but housing was, uh, I mean, I don't know, but in terms of uh, the, the budget, but uh, in terms of headaches for the previous municipal affairs minister, so Leon Robinson, housing would have been, what, 75% of them? Yeah. More, probably. And so, you know, if you're Josie Osborne, <laughs> yeah. that's a pretty, not a bad gig. Not bad. Um, it, no, and moving it to the attorney general is curious. I mean, everything else about David Eby aside, that is a busy, busy, busy ministry. And um, it's going to be hard to see how it's going to get enough attention. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, but look, they were a fraction of their promises uh, going into this election and it didn't hurt them. So maybe maybe they think housing isn't as high a priority anymore as, uh, as it used to be. Um, and, uh, you know, they didn't even give a, there's not even a parliamentary secretary for uh, for housing, which uh, I mean, that would have made sense to me if they were going to do this move. But no, um, the EB does have a parliamentary uh, secretary, but it's uh, for anti-racism initiatives, not yeah, for housing. Yeah, but doing a minister of state for housing would feel like you're demoting the importance of it. No, no, no. I don't mean a minister of state. I mean um, a parliamentary secretary under EB who oh. specifically just focuses on housing. He'd still be the minister of it. Right, right. I Basically uh, like a deputy that, you know, yeah, that's all. Yeah. But, but it, it, it didn't happen. Do parliamentary secretaries really do anything? Like legitimately... It depends, to be honest with you. Some of them, I think some of them do take this, uh, take it seriously. And for some of them, it's a sort of a, a pat on the head because they're not in cabinet. So th- like, there's a mix. Um, there I have been some these. parliamentary secretaries that have done real things. But I mean, if you look at the list here. Yeah. Anti-racism um, initiatives, skills training, which I want to come back to because that affects ISB. Fisheries and aquaculture, environment, gender equity, rural development. Okay. Senior services and long-term care. That's the stapler, Mabel Elmore, by the way. Technology and innovation, Brenda Bailey, mm-hmm. who's the former head of Tech BC. <laughs> new economy, Adam Walker. What, what is the new, new economy? I don't know. These, we have a parliamentary secretary. Emergency preparedness, Jennifer Rice. No offense, Jennifer Rice. 
Um, this would have been helpful, I don't know, two years ago <laughs> in the, given the emergency we're in. Community development and nonprofits, Nikki Sharma. Um, not sure what accessibility, Dan Coulter. Accessibility. Yeah, I'm not sure what the definition of accessibility there. And then Bob Deeth is in arts and film, um, which we already have a minister of tourism, arts, culture, and sport. So is sport and tourism so busy that arts and film have to be carved off? It, it's just curious, these, some of these. Uh, it just feels like a way to bump people's pay, right? Oh, and in some cases it is. I mean, the, the last one you mentioned, Bob Deeth, the Parliamentary Secretary for Arts and Film, that's fine, but the ministry includes, includes tourism, arts, culture, and sport. Does, I mean, even a parliamentary secretary for the film industry would make more sense than arts and film because there's an arts minister. It just, ah. it seems like some awkward doubling up. Now, I haven't seen the mandate letters yet, so there could be some more clarity, but I, I suspect in a lot of cases you're right. This is just some some um, some pats on the head and a, a bump up on their resume. Yeah. Yeah, it's a forty thousand dollars raise if you're a parliamentary secretary. So, um, those are those are questions. We should talk about Marie Rankin, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. So, yes, uh, I think it's fair to say the two star recruits in this uh, field were Marie Rankin and Nathan Collin. Like Horgan wanted yes. them, he went out and got them. He violated NDP rules to put Collin in, um, and one made it into cabinet. Uh, Marie Rankin, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. One did not. Uh, was he Minister of State, Nathan Collin? Minister of State of Lands and yeah, Natural Minister Resources. Rankin first. First of all, um, McLean, in my professional life, I've learned that one of the great, uh, one of the best things to do is to follow someone who wasn't very good at the job you're walking into. Because it's a very <laughs> low bar for you to step over and you look great by comparison. Murray Rankin, I believe, will be employing, <laughs> will be the beneficiary of this as he comes in for someone who I consider to be a very weak and poor uh, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation Minister, uh, the uh, forgettable Scott Fraser, uh, known for Scott's Tots, where he allowed uh, wet sweat and uh, protesters into the legislature in violation of a uh, very clear um, court order not to. I let them in. They then hijacked a room and uh, ate colonial pizza live on Facebook. Great moments <laughs> in BC history. Um, he's gone, Scott, uh, Scott Fraser, and Murray Rankin is in. Um, Murray's a Victoria MLA, so maybe you've got more experience with him. Uh, and I, I must admit, I did not follow his career closely as an NDP MP. I mean, he was a, a former UVic professor who became a, he, he was kind of he, roughly parallel to Andrew Weaver in that respect. Um, who, yeah, I mean, it's hard to make a huge name for yourself as a as a fourth or third party MP in Ottawa, but um, yeah, he's held in high regard and is legitimately popular here in Victoria. I mean, yeah, uh, he won that seat fairly handily, so yeah, it's um, he, he does seem to be well liked. I mean, you mentioned uh, Nathan Cullen and um, Murray Rankin. I mean, you could have also mentioned uh, Finn Donnelly, or in you know two years ago, um, uh, Sheila Malcolmson. Uh, John Horgan has rated. <laughs> Yes. The federal NDP ranks. Yes. Jagmeet Singh's uh, watching them uh, disappear uh, one by one. Colin, the premier yesterday was claiming that, you know, the plan is to carve out lands and natural resources into its own ministry eventually. Um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you wanted to carve it out into its own ministry, it would be carved out already into its own ministry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nothing is stopping Horgan <laughs> from saying, make this happen, kids. Like, that... That to me was a little fishy, and I, I can only imagine the uh, grizzled veterans of the press gallery kind of going, mm, sure, Premier, I'm sure that's what's happening. It, very clearly, Nathan Collins' brand was damaged uh, by um, the mm -hmm. way in which he seized the nomination and then the, uh, the hot mic on the Zoom call. Uh, maybe the worst of the individual NDP campaigns was run by Nathan Collins, and uh, he's being, uh, you know, he still made it in as a Minister of State, but, you know, obviously not into the inner circle. No, and I think you're exactly right. I mean, they, they couldn't just make him a full-blown minister after that campaign. He was a, an embarrassment that got national attention uh, for some very bad reasons. And so, yeah, he's. I, I think he's quite fortunate to be a minister of state uh, in that respect. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, should we talk about the big omission? Yes. Um, ma, now. oh, Ma. Bowen Ma. <laughs> Bowen Ma. Now, she is the Minister of State for Infrastructure under uh, Minister of Transportation Infrastructure, uh, Rob Fleming. But give, me the, give me the pecking order. Would, is Minister of State above Parliamentary Secretary or below? Yes. 
It's above. It's above. Okay. A Go parliamentary ahead. secretary is not a minister in any way, shape, or form. A minister of state is a nice way of saying junior minister. Okay. Is what it is. Uh, they are still technically a member of cabinet, but they sit at the kids' table over to the side, and then yeah. the, the real ministers yeah. sit at the okay. And you report to the minister as opposed to the premier. So there's another, you know, there's another level of the tree you're down. Um, so, so if you're Bowen Ma, and you're yeah. sitting there and you're like looking over the big table, and you see, and this is no, no offense to these people, but you're going to look over and you see Mitzi Dean, yep. Lisa Bear, Melanie Mark, Ann Kang. Um, you kind of like, are you sort of like, mm, was up on this? Yeah, well, even George Chow, who was a minister in the last election, who, uh, you know, if you assembled a list of the cabinet over the last three and a half years and you, you know, bet your life that someone was going to be forgotten, I promise you it would have been George Chow. Um, yeah, Bowen Ma is an interesting case in that there isn't anyone in the NDP aside from you know, John Horgan, David Eby, Adrian Dix, and that might actually be it, that who have a higher public profile than yeah. her um, and better media relations, quite frankly. But... <laughs> she's not in cabinet and she's not a rookie MLA anymore and has seen people uh, leapfrogger. And so, yeah, I think if you are Bo and Mara, you probably at some point had a conversation with the premier saying, what am I, what's, um, what's going on here? Yeah. So let's go back to the election campaign. Obviously the Jane Thornthwaite roast video comes out. Thornthwaite yep. was uh, the, the, the target of her unfortunate and, horrible comments were was Bo and Ma. Ma was yes. very loyal soldier, good soldier for the premier, went out there, uh, looked sufficiently, well, legitimately aggrieved, um, you know, did several days of interviews, worked it on social media, you know, was a good soldier in that, you know, at that kind of hinge point in the election. Um, but no reward. Like, for someone who they tout as like a mini AOC, um, maybe yeah. she is in more ways than one. AOC gets left out of the uh, decision-making structure of the Democratic uh, Party, and uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps Bowen Ma is being treated the same way. Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, you, you mentioned a AOC. Uh, I, I don't think it would be a stretch to suggest that Bowen Ma has modeled her public profile, and especially her social media game, on AOC, which I think is a strategy that has a lower ceiling than many think. Um, I, I don't know of an, another NDP MLA who got publicly swatted down by the Minister of Health during this pandemic yeah. um, because she had made a comment about, you know, thank God it's not the BC Liberals um, Christy Clark running things. Running right. our pandemic. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, who, I mean, if, if the suggestion is she would have not been listening to Dr. Bonnie Henry, I, I just, I don't, it, it seemed baseless. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, Adrian Dix agreed. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, no one else did that. So to me, that suggests that Bowen Ma still has a propensity to uh, not put on a filter, is what I'm going to try and say. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. in cabinet, yeah. it's one thing to make a mistake as a backbench MLA. In cabinet, it's a whole other problem. Um, it's hmm. And so, yeah, I, and she's a minister of state. It's not like she's got nothing. But I, I think that a lot of people would be shocked to see uh, others leapfrog her. And I believe that's why. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, look, uh, ask my 17-year-old daughter uh, for names of BC MLAs. Bowen oh, Ma yeah. would probably be the first one she mentions. Yeah. Um, and, well, ask my oh, – I was going to give my wife's age out. Ask my much younger – more beautiful <laughs> wife. Uh, Good say. An MLA. Uh, I'm sure Bowen Ma would be in her first three or four named. So, yeah. you know, Bowen's connecting with voters in a way that um, other MLAs haven't. You know, certainly, mm -hmm. you know, Murray Rankin, very popular in his riding, but, you know, I don't think I could pay these, I could pay my family a million dollars. They would never come up with the name Murray Rankin, right? Like, it's, it's just interesting how... You know, for all this talk of, you know, they're a young caucus, they're a buzzy caucus, you know, they're ready, you know, this is, they're good people, blah, blah, blah. There is no actual bringing those kind of people into the, into the uh, cabinet fold. One thing we didn't talk about, did they name a speaker yesterday? I assume it's going to be Spencer. Is that? Um, if Spencer they Chandler? did, I missed it. It's yeah. usually not done Mirage. until the first actual day of session. So I don't know. Right. Spencer does seem like the logical choice. It'll either be him or Raj Shohan because yeah. they were the deputy speakers. Right. Um, so 
I, I think Spencer would actually be a good choice. Not yeah. seeing him in cabinet might be a bit of a giveaway there. Yeah, I, I agree. So, um, so, so that definitely makes sense as well. Uh, just one thing that I want to mention, and this is sort of an ICBA thing, so um, <laughs> before warned. They named a minister of, or they named a parliamentary secretary for skills training. It's Andrew Mercier out of Langley, Mary Polak's little riding. Um, you're like, who's Andrew Mercier? Andrew Mercier was the short-lived executive director of the BC Building Trades Council. He took over from another NDP icon named Tom Sigurdsson, but maybe a year ago, uh, was, uh, yeah. is a lawyer, um, by the way, maybe a future AG, who knows? Uh, went into, uh, ran the BC biz, uh, Building Trades, was the beneficiary of the multi-billion dollar sole source um, labor contracting that they're doing on the Patello Bridge and the, the Broadway subway, the so-called community benefits agreements, which are actually a sweetheart deal for the Building Trades unions, representing about 15% of the construction workforce. Now he's in charge of skills training. This is problematic because um, the NDP is already notoriously bad for directing training funds um, training focuses to uh, their buddies in the trades unions. It's a great way for the government to fund their allies, to reward uh, all the hard work they do on behalf of uh, the BC NDP and, and in producing uh, many, many um, uh, candidates and volunteers for their efforts. The problem is that 85% of the construction workers in British Columbia work for companies that are not uh, part of the BC building trades unions. They may be part of other unions, but they're not part of that core uh, NDP support, uh, supportive unions. 82% um, of apprentices in BC are not sponsored by those unions. 82% are sponsored by open shop companies, by um, you know, non-union groups, by progressive unions, um, by ICBA, who, who itself is the single largest sponsor of trade apprentices in British Columbia. If Andrew Mercier goes in there and essentially continues or furthers the sidelining of um, everyone except his building trades cronies, that is bad for construction BC, it's bad for safety, it's bad for attracting young people to the, uh, um, to the industry. So we'll be watching him like a hawk to make sure that he's treating everyone fairly. Um, one would think that if you had 82% of the apprentices, you're doing 85% of the employing and 85% of the training, you should receive 85% of the dollars. That would never happen, but you know, at the very least, you know, he needs to remember he's no longer the executive director. John Horgan said he was going to govern for all British Columbians. Remember the 85% of construction workers who, uh, who aren't part of your old little cabal, uh, Mr. Mercier. Anyways, there you go. I want, and the, the Minister of Labor hasn't changed. That's Harry no. Baines. And uh, I, you know, I think his inclinations are strongly in that direction as well. Um, yes. He has said so. Um, well, former, so steel, I, former steel workers? Uh, or was um, or commercial food Oh, workers? my goodness. I think... It's one or the other. It's either steel or, or food. So my apologies. I should know that off. off uh, I don't remember either. But I mean, there's a strong labor background is yeah. the point we're making here. And so, yeah, it's uh, that is a uh, he and Mercier, I think, will get along very well. Yes. Well, and, you know, they've Harry Baines last time said he would have stripped the secret ballot from unionization oh, yeah. votes. But, you know, Andrew Weaver and the BC Liberals teamed up to stop him. Um, we expect that to be gone soon. And that's taking away a fundamental democratic right. Like secret ballots are important. Heck, you vote on Canadian Idol, American Idol, it's a secret ballot. You should be able to do the same one, uh, <laughs> how you're represented at the work for, workplace. Um, so they'll be looking to strip that out. Um, Harry Baines has said uh, in meetings that, you know, th basically there's no, no such thing as a good employer. Like all employers are evil because we're all, you know, profit driven. That could not be more demonstrably false, especially in this day and age. Um, how you treat your workers is a very important aspect of attracting, of retaining workers, of attracting new ones, of attracting business, clients. Um, in the era of social media, nothing could be further from the truth, but they have that old 1920s mindset that everyone's out to screw the working man, which honestly is just not the case at all. So yeah, we'll be watching Baines and uh, Mercier very, very closely, and you can bet um, ICBA will be making a lot of noise uh, when they, yeah, if they, um, sideline 85% of construction workers in this province. A preview of hot stove topics and yeah. uh, issues uh, in the coming year. We're all going to get real good uh, at labor. Come. Yeah, we're, we're going to get real smart about labor here on the uh, hot stove over the next few <laughs> next few bits. I'm just looking at your piece on the Orca here, McLean. Anything we missed? Mm -hmm. Anything interesting? Uh, let me think. Jimmy. Uh, we didn't talk we about talk Jimmy Sims. 
Yeah, Ginny Sims, uh, who was a minister in the previous cabinet, not going into the election. Uh, she was forced to step down uh, amid some very serious allegations, uh, which um, and the, there was a special prosecutor appointed. The special prosecutor uh, de- declined to pursue because it is very difficult to establish uh, guilt in these things. Um, the NDP took that as complete and total vindication, as you would expect they might. However... Um, Ginny's not in cabinet. Ginny's not a minister of state. Ginny's not a parliamentary secretary. Hmm. To me, this suggests that uh, Ginny had probably caused one headache too many. Because, I mean, I just mentioned the special prosecutor. That that we don't know. But she did get in trouble because she did, you know, get around uh, FOI rules. While the minister responsible for freedom of information, which is astonishing. Um, And so... You know, this was a problem that happened more than once with her, and I, I do not think we will see her back in cabinet anytime soon. Yeah, um, I, I would agree. Um, what's the old sports axiom? You can't lose your job due to injury. Apparently, you can lose your job due to even if you're exonerated by your uh, your special <laughs> prosecutor. Um, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do wonder if it's another subtle message, very subtle, to the BC Teachers Federation. Ginny was a former president of the BCTF. Um, the TF doesn't really have any other former staff or allies other than Ginny Sims in the NDP caucus. I mean, other than their general, you know, involvement in the labor movement. So the TF has been noisy. Uh, they must feel like a pebble in the shoe of John Horgan and uh, Rob Fleming, the previous minister, a lot of days where every time they take a step, they, they feel this little pinch in their shoe. Um, it's a rock in their shoe, but... It's their shoe and their rock. Like, they put it there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, you're right. And, uh, I mean, I, did, I don't even... I should look again. I should know this off the top of my head. But, I mean, did rookie MLA and now Minister Jennifer Whiteside even get a parliamentary secretary? No. Uh, and that would have been a place you might have expected to see someone like Ginny. But, I mean, uh, you know, I don't think anyone would claim she was a star in cabinet. And so... Yeah. Hmm. There you go. Look, uh... You have 50-something MLAs. There's going to be people left out. Um, just seeing someone, yeah. though, drop completely out of cabinet into the backbench is interesting. For the other backbenchers out there, you know, they must be wondering what they got to do. Like, if you're Gary Begg in Surrey, like, you're now a two-time NDP MLA in a riding that was previously held by the Beast Liberals. You've expanded your lead. You don't get a sniff. Um, he's a guy who's a former RCMP officer. Could certainly have been helpful, say, on the Surrey policing transition. Um, Mm -hmm. nothing for him. So, you know, there's a whole swack of them like that that must be kind of wondering what what, what should we do? We didn't also, we we didn't talk about the other big promotion, which was Ravi Kalon, who hilariously, um, I I can't remember if it was Vaughn or Les Lane or whoever wrote it, but essentially, you know, they tried to paint this as this is going to be like the second most important industry, ministry, third most important ministry behind finance and health. It's not. (laughs) Like, no offense, Ravi, but... it's not, and um, you know how I, they. I don't even think I don't even think Ravi would would characterize it that way. I I don't. I just... <laughs> yeah. Not in terms of budget. Not in terms of what's coming down the pike. Uh, I'm not suggesting it's not important, but I mean, it should there be are other ministries. I education. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Public safety. Yeah. Look, look, it should be very important. Not sure it is. Um, in in their little world. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Look, it's uh, obviously early days, um, yeah. as I told some... It's the, uh, the, it's the second day. <laughs> yes, exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. As I told some distraught BC liberal on the weekend, look, uh, seven weeks down, um, 201 to go. Like, you know, you're, you're, you'll get there. Um, although, did you notice John Horgan said um, about Carol James, you know, the dollar a year, but he, he tried to sign her to a five-year, $5 contract? <laughs> no, like, I missed that. Is he planning to extend the mandate to a fifth year, or was he just goofing around? Probably just goofing around, knowing Horgan. Um, he's trying well, to I Horgan's mean, trying to get his yeah. premier dad thing going back again. You know, the uh, Vulcan salute during his oath of office. Don't fall for it, people. This is premier us versus them. Um, Adam Sterling's not going to fall for it. I ain't going to fall for it. Premier dad is dead. This is premier us versus them. Um, Vulcan salutes and five dollar contracts apart. By the way, Carol James, yeah, okay, a dollar a year to be a quote unquote special advisor, but walking out of uh, her uh, public service career with a ninety thousand dollar a year pension, indexed to the rate of inflation, um, she's doing fine. Don't don't cry yourself to sleep okay. worrying that she's not you know that she's grossly underpaid. 
can we can we talk about the the live long and prosper thing just for a second? Because okay. I uh, I tweeted I tweeted it yesterday, uh, simply saying I think literally what I said was, look, it's not a big deal, but would have I advised someone a premier to do this while taking the oath during you know two deadly health pandemics? No, I would not have advised that. But I mean, this is not. I don't think it's a scandal. Some of the responses I got uh, via Twitter publicly and also privately in text are astonishing. People saying, you know, that I'm a joyless old hag who, okay, I mean, fair enough. I, I said it wasn't a big deal. I just wouldn't have advised it. But I also got people saying it was just like blackface. I, mm, no. I, no, I don't think that's even close. No. <laughs> um, and no, that is incorrect. It just, to me, <laughs> that, is, that is a wild swing and a miss. Um, and to me, it just kind of highlighted some of the extreme pol uh, polarization out there. Um, and there were others who took like a uh, Drex responded to me basically saying, you know, just as mildly, I, I think I, I liked it. I thought it was a good idea. I'm like, well, that's fine. You know, great. I'm, I'm not saying it was a scandal. I just, I wouldn't have done it. That's all. Um, I think that's a perfectly reasonable position. But um, so if you're watching this Drex, and I know you are, I'm not including you in the wild overreactions at all. But some of the other things I received, man, guys, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get outside more. Yeah. I... Look, we've, we've gone through a campaign where, like I said, Premier Dad is gone. Premier Us versus Them mm -hmm. is very clear. And when you divide up the electorate, look at the United States, guess what happens? The electorate stays divided. Like, it takes new figures to come in and start bringing people back together. Maybe Biden can do that. We'll see. Um, but, you know, when you've very, I would say, unethically, had an election during a pandemic. The, the thing we haven't talked about is the astonishing Von Palmer piece on the COVID um, outbreak, mm. where there's this, you talk about responses. Anytime I tweet out, like, he gave us social license by calling an election to relax. Jody is on Unspun this week saying that, is that same thing. And I take Jody very seriously on this because she's a, I consider her a normal human with normal reactions on like the jaded political <laughs> operative that I clearly am. But, you know, he did give a social license by unethically breaking a deal, calling an election in the mid, at the beginning of a second wave. Vaughn Palmer's piece showing that 75% of the COVID infections in British Columbia that have ever happened have happened since the day the writ dropped. Stop and think about that for a moment, folks. 75% since the day that John Horgan looked in the camera and said, oh no, we can do an election safely and now is the only time we can possibly do it. That is unfortunate. We, today we had the Prime Minister of Canada who um, came out, who's bungled a little bit this vaccine thing by not you know, trying to make sure that we were at the front of the line, we're gonna be at the back of the line. He says now that he expects the majority of, British, or majority of Canadians will be vaccinated by September, 2021. Okay, if that's the case, you could have had the election in October, 2021, a vaccinated election where we're actually out and about um, you know, meeting candidates, going to town halls, talking to them, having more than one friggin' debate that came, you know, way deep after a million people had already voted. Literally, a million yeah. people had voted. Like, this, is an, this was an unethical decision by John Horgan, who then gave social license to everyone and to relax. Some didn't. Kudos to you if you were just as tough on your hand washing and your social distancing and all of that. I, I'm going to level with you. I wasn't. I haven't come down with COVID. I'm, I'm fortunate. We've tightened the bubble since then. But 75% since the day he called the election. That is a staggering statistic. And I think it's something that, you know, he's got to be held accountable for, even if he does have a majority government and he's feeling his oats so much that he can flash the uh, Vulcan salute in the middle of his swearing in. I think there's been a bit of a lag in the public's uh, feelings about this and that, you know, there was a long time. Um, people were feeling so confident and immune even in BC that we were talking about, you know, um, a, exceptionalism being a problem. People thinking, well, that's, you know, well, in BC, we've beaten it. We've, we've flattened the curve. We did this. And that felt good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it felt safe. Um, and it felt literally exceptional. And now that that is simply not true anymore and hasn't been for a little while, there has been this reluctance to say, well, why? Um, what's happened? What's changed? Now, again, I'm not suggesting that it's specific to BC, but uh, because we've seen uh, a vast increase in cases in Alberta and Ontario and everywhere else, but BC was the envy. BC was the example, and we're not anymore, uh, and it's getting worse. And so at some point, uh, you know, the public is quite right to say, you know, what the hell? Yeah. Um, because 
the, the numbers are the numbers, and they are scary. Another new record yesterday, yeah. and 13 more deaths in one day. Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight, and we're seven. not even talking about uh, record overdose numbers. Five people every single day. That is astonishing and, frankly, really sad uh, and terrifying. And it's, you know, it, it, it's the only government's watch it's happening on is, is the one we have now. Yeah, and in 2016, we heard opposition leader John Horgan say, this is Christy Clark's fault, we can do better. And we're seeing on opioid overdoses. No, he couldn't. And, you know, I'm going to have someone wake up every day. It's going to be the first thought in their head when they wake up. And then the first thought, last thought when they go to bed every day. I'm going to have a minister for it. Gave them $9 million or $10 million a year to spend. His office spent 11. Like, you know, where is the priority uh, on that? So, yeah, um, interesting times. But he's got a majority for three to five years, uh, depending on how long he decides to go. And uh, we will see. But... You know, a little bit of humility. So the, the Vulcan salute to me, not a big deal. Like, I'm, a, I'm a Trekkie, and my God, was Star Trek Discovery good last night? Whew, if you're not watching the third season of Star Trek Disco. I haven't seen it yet. Oh Stay my God, Stay get in there. It's fantastic. But anyways, um, flashing the Vulcan salute, fine, playful, sure. It did smack a little bit of spiking the football. Uh, it smacked a little bit of, you know, the moment he's flashing that salute, we need to remember there were 13 people in British Columbia that day who weren't living long and prospering. They had died of COVID-19. There was five people that day who died of an overdose. There was a record 887 cases. So, you know, Vince McManning, you know, D'Lo Browning, the famous <laughs> gif your way into the ring like you're the cock of the walk oh. is not a great look. Don't spike the football in the middle of a pandemic. And that's the only criticism I'll, I'll make of the flashing the uh, live long and prosper side. It's not a huge deal, but it does show you the mindset. Like he was, you know, he's, he was feeling it. It's the bat, it's the unnecessary bat flip in a game that was already yeah. marred by a brawl. Yeah, no, yeah, and that's actually a, a, a good example. It's not, is it, is it a scandal? No, and that's what yeah. I tried to say, make clear yesterday. It's, it's not, it, it's not worth, you know, storming the gates over. No, but we're not going to recall him over I, it. Yeah, I, I, I just, I wouldn't have, the way I put it is the way I would continue to put it. I would never have advised it. Yeah. And um, especially not with the two uh, epidemics. It's just, mm. but that said, it, it, it's not, it, it's not a scandal. And it's, if you're uh, for my, uh, my listener um, uh, and follower on social media, it is not blackface. No, no. <laughs> Nothing Give your head is a blackface, shake. my friend. Yeah. yeah. Give your head a shake. All right. That's all I got. Yeah, me as well. Uh, we'll be back on Tuesday for a regular edition of BC Poly Hot Stove. And, uh, and I will give us a little preview. One of the things I want to talk about is what's happened uh, to, to our neighbors in Alberta with a, a leak uh, there. I know, you know, I know you know what I'm talking about, um, but I do want to talk about that a little bit uh, because it has some implications here. Uh, so there, there's a teaser. We don't do enough of those. Yeah, uh, and also, I'm actually, that's a good conversation because I'm curious to hear from you as a former staffer who's made recommendations mm -hmm. to ministers and premiers before um, about the sanctity of those conversations. Yeah, I, I do have a slightly different, I mean, now that I'm, you know, actively trying to find those scoops yes. <laughs> and previously yeah. was guarding against them, I, I, I do think I have a slightly different perspective and I, I look forward to talking about it with you because I know you've, uh, you know, held public office as well. Um, until then, uh, he's Jordan Bateman. I'm McLean Kay. This has been BC Poly Hot Stove. Happy politics. <laughs>